Do you have any events coming up from your organization? Or We do. Um, we actually have one this week. <laughs> Uh, it's our big kind of party of the year. It's called Wine and Wolves, <laughs> and uh, and um, Atka makes an appearance. And it's uh, right. It's about two minutes away from the Wolf Center. It's in actually the Wakabuck Country Club in South uh, Salem. In South, uh, it's like a ha yeah, basically it's South Salem, but it's called Wakabuck. Um, but uh, it's a lot of fun, and, and it's a real community event because we get all of the local. Um, restaurants and wine shops and vendors they all donate their food and things for our auction and raffle and so there's no cost on our part. Oh good, so it's all profit. Um, and so it's all profit and that means also the tickets are 100 percent tax deductible. Now I, I think this is a good time you know and they probably doing a post-production to put up your your group's website and if people want more information yeah. or to donate no, definitely. You'd, yeah, you'd be more than happy to accept donations. No, stuff. yeah, we uh, most of our funding actually comes from either p coming to visit us or education programming or individual donations. So now, I, I went there with my son Michael, uh, I think in February, and talk about how you feed the wolves that you you house. Sure. Um, well, you know, Atka, he's our ambassador wolf. We have right. three other ambassador wolves. And uh, Zephyr, Nakai, and Alewa. Zephyr? And, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, they all get, um, and these guys are always going to be captive wolves. These are the wolves we hand raise. Um, they're not for reintroduction. No, no, they're really there to help um, opening the door to understanding the importance of their wild kin, so to forge a connection between our visitors and those wolves in the wild landscape. And uh, so they have a very flexible menu because they don't have to know what appropriate food is. So, um, you know, they get, like, Atka's been getting a lot of deer legs recently. Um, we get a lot of donations, actually, from Whole Foods, which really? is amazing. Yes, Whole Foods has really fattened up our ambassador wolves. <laughs> um, we don't, we rarely have to buy food. It's amazing. Oh, Unless great. someone has, like, some sort of medication they need, maybe we'll have to get, like, ground turkey to make meatballs or something. But for the most part, we don't, we don't have to buy the food. It's fabulous. Now, for the Mexican wolves and red wolves that we house, basically, um, we participate in this federal uh, recovery program for both of these uh, kinds of wolves. They're both critically endangered. And uh, for both of these types of wolves, um, they got down to such limited numbers in the wild, they actually went extinct in the wild. So the last remaining um, individuals were in zoos. Oh, wow. um, for the red wolf, there were only 14 um, uh, wolves remaining on the planet. And for the Mexican wolf, only seven. So they How were, long ago was this? This was just a, several decades, you know, 70s. Wow. And uh, so for both of these guys, they had to start recovering them from captivity. So what they did is they established breeding programs for both of these type of wolves, not with each other, just kind of both happened at the same time. And uh, eventually were able to reintroduce these wolves back into their native habitat. Uh, for the red wolf, it's in North Carolina. And for the Mexican gray wolf, it's Arizona, New Mexico, and just more recently, northern Mexico. And uh, so, but what they do is they have to have these wolves in captivity, uh, producing them for reintroduction. Right, right, right. So uh, what we do as a participant, we house them, we care for them. Um, it's kind of like stud wolves, right? Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Uh, we do captive breeding. We make recommendations for release. But one of the things that we want to do to prep them for release is not have them available for the public. Right. So we're kind of a tease in that we're like, we have 20 some odd wolves, but right. you can see six. You know, well, but yeah. I think people understand once, once they come well, and visit. I, I, and you know what? From the, uh, the presentation that the volunteers put on when we were there, you, you don't notice that. You, you, you really, you're, you're enraptured with the wolf that you're, you're watching. Yeah. You know, Maggie and I both grew up in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, it's amazing to me that you're doing this. But God bless you. But uh, <laughs> I, but but one of the and we talked about this the other day. One of the things that living in this area affords us both is the ability to go out into the woods and to spend some time. You know, for me, it's you know a few hours, and then get back home. Which you know, being a city person, I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to stay out there. That's, that's <laughs> like being homeless. I want to get back home. But I, I really enjoy. Yeah. You know, what I, what I, you know, when I get out there. You know, I just want to hit on another area. You know, it, story in the Times today about, uh, you know, the Global Warming Treaty hopefully being reached and how really dire uh, the global warming problem is. So they were talking about, you know, if we're lucky, we'll, we will just have, you know, extremely bad consequences. If we're not lucky, it'll be the end of, you know, humankind. Uh, how is global warming going to affect animals like, you know, endangered species like the wolf? 
Um, well, you know what's interesting, even though you know it's been kind of taboo or politicized to even talk about global warming or climate change, you know, politically for some time. Um, on the state level, when you're working with like the New York Department of Environmental Conservation and you know the biologists and scientists yeah. that are actually hired and working for the state, that's all they're talking about. Yeah. And uh, they're talking about the resilience of certain species, uh, both plant and animal. And uh, so resilience is really key. And what, when it comes to wolves, they're, they're very resilient. Um, they're very adaptable. I mean, basically, they've lived almost everywhere on this planet in the northern hemisphere at one time or another. However, the animals that they depend on um, and also the habitat that their prey depends on okay. might not be so resilient. So, you know, there have been some cases, uh, there's one uh, very interesting island study where wolves, these wolves have been studied for over probably about close to 60 years at this point, or between 50 and 60. And uh, it's an island of, uh, in Lake Superior, in Isle Royale. And they had these wolves on this island. And so it's, it's just totally an island study where they have fox, wolves, moose, and not too much going on. But it was a very... And this was a natural recurring... Yeah. Okay. It was a great... Well, I, I think they actually did introduce them way back when. Okay. But uh, it was very interesting. But um, they were able to have genetic flow for some time onto this island because Lake Superior would freeze. Um, ah. And uh, actually last year, because the polar vortex, that again. whole thing, they finally had that ice bridge come and it had been a while. And uh, they did have uh, some wolves, well, actually one, one of the very few females on the island left and she got killed in one of the public hunts. Oh. But, um, but that has been a case where things like that um, is where it's going to impact the wolf population. Um, these longer springs and, and warmer falls, um, that, has a, that really boosts the insect population, which can be devastating um, for animals like it deer or moose. It has a cascading effect. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's where it's going to, it's probably going to impact wolves the same way it impacts us, where it's not really going to be us directly. We're not going to burn up in flames because it's warm or freeze because right. we have clothes and we're resilient. We can take care of ourselves. It's similar with wolves. Um, but the world around them is going to change, and I think that's, that's really what's going to impact them. And, and you know what, I think sometimes when we talk about global warming, uh, what it's important to realize, is if, if there is global warming, what it's going to do is cause climate change. So just because, you know, it, it, it snows doesn't mean the planet's no. not getting warmer. Yeah, uh, I wish yeah. they never, whoever yeah. invented it, 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 it was a bad name. Yeah. Because we get a bad winter like last winter, and everybody goes, oh, oh, there's your global warming. Yeah. But, you know, they're not looking at, you know, the ice uh, sheet in the Greenland over time and seeing how it's receding. It, it's, it's scary stuff. You know, there's, there's three young people in the, audi in the audience filming us today, and I, I often feel so bad about the world we're leaving them. You know, sorry, kids. <laughs> uh, just talk about where you are, so people who want to come and visit. You look at what's the address? So um, we're dressing, uh, our address is in South Salem at Seven Buck Run, and um, in order to visit, we're a little bit difficult, but again, it's for a good reason. Um, you have to pre-register um, to attend one of our programs. So we're not a zoo that you could just walk on through. And what our programs are, that it's going to have an educational component. We're going to be in our classroom and really learn uh -huh. about werewolves are, their history, you know, pack dynamics, their diet, behavior, what have you. Um, but then you're going to have a chance to see the wolves. And I think because of that, people have a better appreciation um, for what they're seeing when they actually do see the wolves or when they get to howl with the wolves or what have yeah, you. That was fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, the fact that they're not going to see all, you know, 13 Mexican wolves. Um, I think they also have a better understanding that they're, they're really, they're visiting some place that, that is, is, is just, there's actually active recovery going on. And, uh, you know, we've released a number of our wolves into the wild, and it's just the most um, amazing feeling to know that you have these little New Yorker wolves, <laughs> you know, and then they get a chance for the first time in their lives, there's no fences or no people, and they're just wild animals. And it's really the most gratifying thing that I you bet. can give these animals is freedom. Yeah. And you just have to hope that they stay safe and do their job. Do you ever envision a time where, you know, a natural recurring pack will come to New York or um, You know, wolves, wolves have returned uh, to the Northeast region from time to time. Uh, basically, that would require them crossing um, the Canadian border. Okay. Um, however, the only evidence of their recolonization has been in the form of dead wolves. So unfortunately, we have an animal called the Eastern Coyote um, here in the Northeast, and, uh, and we have very aggressive hunting 
of this animal uh, throughout all the entire region, New York included. Um, it's, it's actually ironic because, you know, they have these hunting derbies uh. um, out west where it's, you, you get paid prizes, what have you, for the biggest coyote or, you know, the number of coyotes and, and a lot of New Yorkers are, you know, shame on you, Idaho or wherever. And yet we have them right here in New York yeah. as well. And, uh, and because we have these, these, these hunts, they're very easily mistaken for wolves because we don't actually have wolves here right. officially. So the only wolves that had been managed to get through the aggressive trapping and hunting in Canada and also here in, in um, the Northeast, um, they do end up getting killed. Now, now, does Canada protect their wolves, or is it that it just have some in it they don't need to protect? No, Canada has lots of wolves, and uh, and they've hunted wolves for. I don't think they've ever. I don't. I don't think they've been protected ever. Um, there is one wolf that is protected. It's the um, eastern wolf or the Algonquin wolf, and the only place I believe these wolves um, reside today, where they're actually genetically pure as they can be, is within Algonquin Park. Um, and uh, for these guys, for them to get down to us, they do have to go through uh, right south of the park where they have very heavy trapping. Um, and that's, that's problematic. Let, let me ask you, because this is something that's come up in America, it's come up in Rye and a couple of uh, these suburban communities. If you encounter uh, a, a coyote in your area, but, you know, how do you react? What, what, what's the best way to, you know, protect yourself, protect the coyote, and not mm -hmm. overreact? And... Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, when they actually see a coyote, they take that as a threat, where sometimes it's a coyote just trying to get from one place to the next. Yeah. And uh, when most conflict or sightings will occur is usually in the spring. And that's, uh, you know, wolves and coyotes, they're monoesterous. They breed once a year during mm -hmm. the winter months. And quite often it's the early spring or you know, April-ish, um, where the, uh, the mom will have her pups. And so she'll be in a den with her pups, and so it's just going to be basically the dad going out trying to get food to bring him back. And that's where he might be a little bit more desperate or a little bit more visible. He's uh -huh. not going to have the rest of his family, and he has that pressure of getting food back for everyone else. Um, but, you know, there's lots of deterrents um, to things to help prevent sort of conflict. First of all, you know, just don't leave dog food outside you know same thing you know, food cat food same yeah. with you know just take care of your garbage and that's with every animal you know that's yeah. how you habituate animals is from eat, feeding them whether it's actively feeding them or passively feeding them by leaving your garbage about um, I would recommend uh, especially during the spring if you have small dogs they're just kind of out loose just keep an eye on them maybe stay out there with them um, but if you see a coyote and you're and you're not like I see a coyote I get my camera right. but if you see a coyote and you, and you don't want it on your property or what have you you know get pots and pans bang them throw rocks at the animal you know right. um, let the coyote know it's not welcome and give it a, an escape route yeah you know even we had a fun thing that we did with our campers um, we made rattlers uh, where you just take a, an empty aluminum can, stick nuts and bolts or coins in there, yeah. and then you just duct tape it shut. And they're they're really annoying. <laughs> Don't do <laughs> to your kids, but you just shake them, and it's, they're they're terrifying. And even keeping things like that. Do you have a summer camp at the Wolf? We do. Oh, I'll talk a little bit about that. We do. We have like one minute left. So just... um, our summer camp, it's fun. Uh, it's just a week-long um, camp, so it's a sh one of those short ones. Uh, but the kids are going to be uh, learning all about wolves. They're going to have uh, a chance to walk with Atka, take uh, his cast of his paw prints in the mud and okay. take them home, um, using radio telemetry with a collar and learning how to track wolves like okay. biologists do. Uh, they all get a certificate at the end. They make oh, up their own wolf-like uh, fairy tale. It's a lot of fun. Um, I, I hope you've learned something about wolves and how important wolves are to our ecosystem and to the future of our biodiversity. Until the next time, I'm Tom Murphy, and thank you for tuning in.